Social values here somewhat complement Surah al Nisa. Surah al Nisa also talks about uh, social values and social interactions and the haramat, haramat alaykum wa hatikum wa baratikum. Also spoke about ihsan, uh, also spoke about uh, adultery. Uh, so this Surah came to complement Surah uh, al Nisa in terms of the ahkam, of the subject matter concerning the ahkam. And also, um, uh, in terms of subject matter, also complements Surah Al Ahzab, uh, which a lot of scholars say this is the Surah came before Surah Al Nur. In a sense that uh, on one start a discussion and the other finishes. And this Surah speaks about three uh, major themes or major subjects. The first subject is social, more human interaction and decency. The explicit orders of the Hijab, we know that. Um, uh, came before Surah Nur. Um, came um, after 18, 19 years of revolution. Uh, but this social and moral, moral feeling has been uh, a core component of Islamic teaching from the very beginning. The explicit orders, however, are just the icing on the top of the cake. So there's a lot of training, spiritual training, uh, and reminders beforehand for 18, 19 years. So when the commandments came, they were all already ready to follow the commandments. Uh, same what happened with the, the, the revelation uh, of Ahkam of uh, alcohol. The revelation came gradually. And uh, we spoke about how the Sahaba, uh, when the final revelation came, that the Jutanibu, stay away from it, uh, the Sahaba were literally vomiting. Uh, so every drop of alcohol in the system, uh, they got rid of it, and also bankrupting themselves because of the commodity at that time. So getting rid of that commodity, that will bankrupt themselves. But they, this is how the Sahaba, after the, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the revelation, uh, they were 
Bring it to that moment. The, the surah also spoke about uh, the second theme of the surah is Iman of faith, with a, a panoramic view of the heart of the believer. Uh, what we can call it spiritual cardiology. The connection becomes apparent between the two topics because without Iman, all the do's and don'ts doesn't make any sense. So we have to have Iman. So when we fulfill the, the Sharia law, the Islamic law, we are aware of uh, what we're doing. Because without Iman, there's no point of applying Islam. And this passage comes right in the middle of the Surah. The third theme of Surah to Law, uh, the Surah spoke about hypocrisy, law and order, discipline of the Muslim community. Because a lot of, a lot of uh, incidents happened, and the revelation came to clear up matters for the Muslim and teach him how to react to those sort of incidents. So Allah brings all together the different uh, facts of all believers' life, talking about discipline in army to the discipline at home. And we mentioned that Allah started the surah with the word surah, and it came as uh, nakal, not with alif lam al that to give it more significance. Surah, which is a set of verses that the revelation from the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally telling us that this surah is going to be a, a, a complete unit. So all the instruction in it is very important. That you, that's why start with the word surah. So pay attention to what comes next. And complement that by saying wa meaning make everything far compulsory. Uh from the word uh, like it originated in Arabic words means carving in the wood. So everything that comes in this surah, every instruction will be complete, solid. It's not going to be changed. So be prepared for it. Okay? Allah then after that spoke about the first punishment, which is uh, the punishment of uh, adultery in Islam. And differentiate between those who are moksha and those who are not moksha. Spoke about this last time. And after that, in ayah number, number three, Allah recommend that, you know, uh, you know, it is not it's not recommended for a fornicator to marry another person. Okay? To choose always um, a righteous spot. Uh, and this is also came with the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained that in the Hadith uh, that women get married for four reasons. For her, uh, for her family and her image, or her wealth, or her beauty, and her religion. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized that religion is the most important element. That every Muslim man should be seen to is the religion. Tadfa bidati din and it is better for you to marry the one with the religion. Right? Um, Allah also subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about um, the punishment of slandering other people. And he warned us as a Muslim community to not go around. And accuse people of of the bad deeds. So we have to be very careful before we utter any words. Because the moment we say those type of words or accuse someone of something they didn't do, we are entitled to this punishment, which is eighty lashes. Okay. And this is this is uh, a great a great uh, law. Because it, it, it protects health, protects dignity of all the Muslim members in the community. And this religion, indeed, one of the objectives of Sharia, one of the, the, the objectives is Hibb al Nafs, Hibb al Aqd, and Hibb al Aqd. The objective of Sharia is to preserve life, preserve intellectual, and also preserve dignity for people. So these are the main objectives of our deen, for the whole collectively to the whole entire religion is to protect people's life, protect people intellectual, protect people's dignity. Because these are laws that the most part of the Allah made a compulsion. So everyone knows that there is a punishment. If you say one word like this, there's a punishment after that, so everyone will remain quiet. You will never say it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made it clear that 
in order to apply the punishment of adultery or zina, you have to four you have to have four people who are when known as being truthful and honest, and also all four of them saw what happened and have the same story without fail. And this is basically make it impossible to apply the rule. And and in all the all the uh, through the Sira and the Brothers of Rasulullah and the Sahaba, we all know that this rule or this punishment applied only when the Sahaba or someone who committed came and uh, confessed to the Rasulullah. They wanted to be purified in this life. We also spoke about uh, what happened if a person came to his house and found his wife with another man, or the other way around. If a woman came and found her husband with another woman, that she is not his wife, or her, uh, he is not her husband. Okay? So, what happened in this case? Do we need four witnesses, or it would be enough for the husband or the wife to make to make an oath. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. That he has to make four oaths by Allah that she did it. And the fifth one is to say that the curse of Allah will be fall on him if he's lying. And after that, there have to be separation. And they cannot remarry again after that. This is the Islamic thing. They cannot be married again. This is Allah's rule. Because after this accusation, it cannot be fixed. It's like it's like a, you know, a glass window is broken. You cannot put it together. It's finished. So if the husband accuses his wife of something like this, it's going to be impossible to be reunited. In, only if he did the la'an. If he didn't do the la'an, then life continues. They really work together and things like that. And it's between them both. But if he did the la'an, if the la'an was applied, then they have to be separated by the Islamic court, by the judge. And that means they cannot be reunited again as husband and wife. That's, yeah. This is the Islamic law. Just for example, like in this, in this country, you can apply the Sharia law. So, like, for example, a husband finds um, the wife sleeping with another man. Mm. And, like, they, they divorce their wife. Mm. So, um, okay, they, they get divorced. And then after that, the husband wants to get back to the wife. So, um, in this in this condition, they didn't apply the Sharia law. Mm. So, is it possible for them to reunite? Well, now, this is a very complicated question. <laughs> um, I think the was not applied. It was just a normal mm-hmm. divorce. So he divorced her, okay. and he didn't apply the Laan. The Laan is different. The Laan, both of them has to stand in front mm-hmm. of each other. In front of the judge in the Islamic court, in the Islamic setting, and both of them have to make the oath. Mm-hmm. She also has to make an oath. And if this happened, the consequences of this is the separation, and they cannot come back. What you mention is a different story. Allahu mm-hmm. um, He divorced her, all right, and he want to come back to her. Then he, I think, will be okay, all right. Uh, but it will be a difficult decision for him. And for her. And Allah knows the rest. Allah Allah. In Ayah number 10, Allah says, وَلَوْلَا فَضُّ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ رَحْمَتُهُ وَلَوْلَا فَضُّ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ رَحْمَتُهُ And if not the favor of Allah uh, upon you and His uh, mercy, do not form upon you. In ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ أَصْبَاتٌ مِنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُونَ شَرًّا لَكُمْ مِنْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And this is basically what we're going to talk about today, inshaAllah, or tonight. The incident of Ifk. Does anyone know what that means? The incident of Ifk? Have you heard about it? Ifk. The incident of Ifk. Oh. 
ولولا فضل الله عليكم ورحمته وان الله تواب رحيم ان الذين جاءوا بالاسم عصبه منكم لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم لكل امرئ منهم ما اكتسب من الاسم والذي تولى كبره منه له عذاب عظيم. If literally mean deviation to turn from the right direction that when you know where you have to go but you still deviate from the path. And also means uh, a great life. So if deviation or a great life. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. You have to pay a fine. I was in another class just now. I know I saw you in the other class. <laughs> So if it uh, talks about the, the famous story that happened at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu concerning his wife Aisha radiallahu anha that a group of hypocrites accused Aisha radiallahu anha of committing the bad deed with another sahaba. The, the story goes that the Prophet his sunnah used to um, choose one of his wives if he's traveling or if he's going on an expedition he used to choose one to go with him in that, in that expedition and that goes through the Qur'an or um, he tosses them up between them and whoever her name comes first she goes with him so he doesn't choose favorably but he gives um, uh, uh, fairness to, to all of his wives and that day, uh, her, Aisha radiallahu anha came to join him in his expedition. Then she went with him. And she used to be carried on a camel, a special camel for her, with a helmet, with like a, a special, uh, uh, what do you call it, a closed compartment that she sits in it and covered completely, will be carried on the top of the camel. So that compartment. So you could be, someone could be sitting inside and no one can see him or her. Okay, and that would play a major role in that incident. Alright? What happened? She lost one of her necklaces that she took with her. And she came out of the compartment of the, of the tra- traveling camel to look for it. So she went to look for it. And then she got tired. And she couldn't find it. She went back to the same spot where uh, the camp was, where all the army was camping and resting on the way back and she found that everyone left and she found herself on her own in the middle of nowhere right? and we remember Aisha was alive and was young so she waited there that they would realize you know, the house is empty and she's not there and they would come back for her as we know it's covered and um, according to some narration, that she wasn't heavy, she was light. No one could notice uh, that she's not, uh, she's inside the house or not. So no one could tell. And of course, out of respect for her, no one would tell. So they continue until um, later, and then uh, she, she sat there and she uh, felt tired and she fell asleep. And then one of the Sahabi came after. He was following the army, but he wasn't in the same caravan. He was coming on his own. And he saw a, a, a shadow from a distance. And then he called out. And then uh, she said, you know, what happened? Then he offered his camel for her. And then he took her back to Medina. The Munafiqeen, including Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salim, which is the head of Munafiqeen, the head of the servants, he's the first one to start talking bad about Aisha So he said, you know, this is what happened. So they start talking bad. So Safwan ibn Mu'attal uh, al-Silmi, he's the Sahabi who took care of Aisha to bring her back to Medina. Okay? Like any Sahabi would do. Like anyone in this situation would do. Okay? But by the time they arrived there, the rumor start spreading, which is the if incident. Alright? So everyone start talking about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the Medina Jaw bil ifti, Osbatun minkum. And look at the terminology of the Quran. 
He said, if mean a great lie, an evil lie, or deviation from the truth. That someone knows the truth, but he deviates from it. Deliberately. So if someone knows the truth, but he doesn't say it. Okay? Usbatun means people that think alike. A gang mentality. They have the same mentality. Alright? Um, trying to intimidate other people. It is not just a masculine strength, it is also social strength. So when you hang out with your favorite people, your favorite gang, you're more comfortable to, you know, um, attack other people. Like, especially the young, young age, and others, adolescents. Or people, when they get together, they, you see more troubles coming out of them. Like gang stuff, yeah. Yeah, like gangs and stuff. See, so at the schools or uh, public transportation, you see little kids together and they, they have that gang mentality. So when we're out together, we're strong from doing, we can, you know, abuse this person and we can do this or do that and start putting that one name and making fun of this person. But if they are on their own, they won't be doing that. Is that true? They won't be doing that. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Osbat that, that, uh, gang, that guru you, that evil guru you has said that about or spread that evil lie, um, about Aisha. But just remind me, this revelation didn't come after the incident straight away. Do you know how long it took? A month. A month. And this is what so much stress on Aisha on the Prophet because his wife was accused. It's not anyone, his wife and beloved wife is accused of something like this. Right? Um, so it wasn't easy on him, or it wasn't easy on her, her parents. Um, uh, um, Umar, the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq, and her, her Aisha, her mother, and her mother. And Abu Bakr Siddiq, the best companion of the Prophet. So it was a very hard situation on the family of Rasulullah. Um, but this proved uh, a lot of things. If you remember, if you attended with us, Surah Al Kahf, I think two years ago. Um, we spoke about the reason of revelation of Surah Al-Kahf. And the reason of revelation that the Mushrikeen sent one of them to Medina to ask some of the Jews about you with us, mm-hmm. right? To, um, to ask about any type of question to trick the Prophet Sallallahu so he won't be able to answer them in public, so he'll be, you know, his credibility won't be as good as before. So he, he won't be able to answer those questions. So they told him to ask these three questions. What do you know about the people of the cave? What do you know about Dhul Qarnay? And what do you know about this cave? And the man came and I went to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him about those three questions. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, come tomorrow, I'll tell you. Hoping that the revelation will come overnight. The revelation didn't come overnight. The revelation came after 10 days. To answer those questions. Not just to answer them, but to give full details. And that was the revelation of Surah Al-Kahf. That was the reason of the revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the revelation of Surah Al-Kahf to explain the story of the people of the cave, to explain the story of the Qarnay, to explain this, uh, what the spirits mean, and also give more details about the life after death, give more, um, uh, more information about the, the trial of wealth and the trial, trial of knowledge. Again, amazing Surah of the Quran. And uh, we should actually uh, study it at some stage. It's actually so much for Sunnah Sahih to start the surah as well every Friday. So uh, the revelation also of this ayah to clear things came after one month, and it was very tough on the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and um, uh, on his wife as well and himself. Uh, but at the same time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, never disrespect Aisha anha, never was harsh with her, he was sad about what happened. And he asked her a question, you know, if you've done this, you will make istighfar. And if you didn't do it, Allah will send revelation. He was hoping the revelation would come. But that was also wasn't enough for, for Aisha as a wife. You know, she was still hurt, you know, that you know uh, and she would never thought that the revelation would come to purify her reputation. And and defend her. She thought that she is, is not uh, you know, big enough that the revelation will come to defend her. This is how humble she was, even at that time of difficult uh, time for her. Abu Bakr Siddiq, he had one relative. That relative he used to um, 
He used to look after him. He used to give him money. He used to look after him. He used to take care, good care of him. That relative spoke bad about Aisha. He's one of the Sahab. So he spoke or he repeated what the, the Munafiqin said. So Abu Bakr got upset. And he said, I'm not going to, uh, I won't spend any cent on him anymore after what he said. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation. Allah sent revelation speaking to about the action of Abu Bakr. Saying to him, if you were going to give money, don't stop giving for the sake of Allah. If you want Allah to forgive you, you need to forgive Allah. Then Abu Bakr, when he heard the revelation, he said, of course I want Allah to forgive you. I want Allah to forgive you. So he continued his ataya, he continued his gifts to this person, even though he hurt him badly. I spoke bad about his work. How, how many of us would do that? <laughs> right? It is, it, is, it is amazing. Like when you read through uh, these little details and extract these little lessons, um, it is amazing. Also, part of the incident of what happened, there was a small fight between Sa'd ibn Mu'ad and uh, another Sahabi, uh, Sa'd ibn Ubad. Sa'd ibn Ubad is the master or the, uh, the chief tribe or uh, head, the, the tribe head uh, or the chief of the tribe of, of Khazraj. And Sa'd ibn Mu'ad is the chief of the, the tribe of Aus. The both of them are like two, two heads of the tribe. So they said, whoever said that, we will take good care of him. That means we'll, we'll beat him. Cannot, cannot say this about the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sa'ad ibn Ubada, he was a righteous sahab of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi but he has hamimi. Because Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salud is from his tribe. He is related to him, unfortunately. So he, he got upset, you know, how could you attack someone of my family? So they start fighting. In the presence of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them off, and they stopped. And uh, they were waiting for the revelation still. Aisha radiallahu anha used to cry a lot because of what happened. As I said before, it's not an easy, uh, easy thing on her. And uh, she used to, uh, she asked the permission of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that she go back to her, her parents' house. So she moved to her parents' house to stay with her mom, maybe and then help her and comfort her a little bit. Um, and the Prophet used to check on her. And this is a great lesson to all of us. Uh, as a, you know, as a great role model for the Prophet, a great husband. Even at this time of difficulty, he would still, you know, check on her and ask how we do it. Okay? And tell her to be patient. For the revelation to come back. Then the revelation came, and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he was smiling when he heard that when he received the revelation. He went to Aisha and he says, "Smile." The revelation came. Allah Subhanahu wa says, uh, "He told her, Ya Aisha, Ahmadillah, Taqad Barwa Oh Aisha, thank Allah because Allah sent uh, the, uh, the evidence of your innocence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنِّي لَذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ وَأَشْرَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ So, part of the, the lesson, or part of the, the beauty of the Qur'an, and what we learn from this ayah is, this shows um, how Aisha is, uh, how Aisha's status in the Muslim community, how honorable status she had, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation till today, that we recite in her defense. And also answer those people that they accuse, still accuse her in now. And they don't believe in the Quran. They say we're Muslim, but they still accuse Aisha. They said we get closer to Allah by cursing Aisha. What type of mentality are this? Accusing the wife of the Prophet and saying this is you know, bring us closer to Allah. This is, you're going against the Sahih of the Quran. You go against the Quran. A revelation came down to defend Aisha of the law and you still accuse her. So you're going against the Quran. That means you're not Muslim anymore. 
So it also this surah it exposed the, the Shia mentor as well about what they say about the Sahaba and about the life of the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. In the Ladia Jaw is to Osba to Minkum, let us have more Shabbat Lakum, then who are higher than Lakum. Don't you don't you think it's bad for you, rather it's good for you because it exposed those who are Mulaka to those who are hypocrites and their followers. And also uh, shows how uh, how mentally strong Aisha and the Prophet and Abu Bakr and the close Sahaba to Rasulullah to face that type of um, uh, of rumors, type of challenges in the community. In Surah Al Hijrat, if you remember, we spoke about uh, how the Muslims, or the Surah taught us how the Muslims should react in time uh, of rumors in the community. Allah subhanahu wa says in Ayah number 6 Ya ayuhu al-lazina amin al-jaakum fasukum bi-ibrahim fatabayyahu Fawzuhu believe when a fasuk come to you with another with a special news that is related directly to you fatabayyahu So this is the commandment we need to make fatabayyahu We need to seek clarification and clarification before we take action Otherwise we regret what we do in the future And also uh, the Prophet said in the hadith, Kafa bin Mar'i Kazibam al Hadditha, and the Hadditha bi kulli ma sama, and the Hadditha bi kulli ma yasma. It is enough for a person to, to be called a liar if he repeat everything he hears. Because not everything he hears is true. So if you become a parent and repeat everything you hear and spread what you were told in the community, you will help it. And you'll continue to spread lies about the people. And that's what the Prophet warned us. And the act of the tongue can lead to a diseased heart. Uh, Prophet made it uh, clear in another hadith that it's after Imam of the last day, it is important to keep your mouth shut or say good news only. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, two pillars of our Imam. We cannot be called believers until we believe all, all the six pillars of Iman and the five pillars of Islam. Right? Prophet to highlight the importance of the act of the tongue, that we have to either say goodness or remain quiet. Goodness when we read the Quran, goodness when we remember Allah, goodness when we are trying to help people, goodness when we teach Quran, when we teach people good manners. Alright? This is goodness, this is what tongue should be doing all the time. And the best Thing that tongue should be doing is dhikr Allah Azza wa Jal, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, and he also warned us in another hadith that the servant of Allah would say a word, he would be falling in the hellfire for 70 or sorry, 70 years falling in the hellfire for one word he didn't or she didn't pay attention to what he or she said. That he would be falling in the hellfire. And in another hadith, Mu'ad. Great Sahaba Rasulullah came to the Prophet and he asked him a question. A question that raised concern from the Prophet. He said, Are we accountable of what we say? Prophet got upset with Ma'ad. He said, May your mother leave you. It's a metaphor. If someone is upset with someone, it doesn't mean that the Prophet made uh, a dua against Mu'ad. He loved Mu'ad, one of the Sahaba, one of the Ali. So he told him, basically reprimanded him, or told him of, for asking that kind of question. And he told him, most of the people will be dragged on the, uh, in the hellfire on their face and in their nose because of the reek of what they found. Because of what they said. So we have to guard this tongue. This tongue can lead to us to so many troubles. And in terms of, of rumors, we have to be careful. Because at the, at the beginning of this surah, Allah Ta'ala Ta'ala told us that what happened if we if we start accusing people, they have Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala tells those who accuse uh muhsanat. Muslim women, something they haven't done. Alright? And the other way around as well. Alright? Women accuse Muslim or Muslim Muslim men. 
uh, and there will be uh, a great punishment for that. To God, our punishment, to God, what we say. The moment. Yes. <coughs> this is also, uh, it's not only the tongue, your fingers pushing WhatsApp messages, which is not correct. It's also the same act, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so whatever works for the tongue now, like writing down things against Islam, also same like you're saying, as send it, um, share it on social media. This is something we should be careful with. Mm. Yeah, absolutely right, yeah. Yeah. Because before you type it, you actually said it. Mm. Yeah. So, this became an opportunity for revelation, and revelation is a timeless treasure. The good out of you, Aisha radiallahu having gone through this difficulty, is that generations of Muslims will learn guidance for eternity out of this. This is a great guidance to all Muslims until the day of Your pain is neither uh, is their guidance, so do not think it is bad. Every time a Muslim learns or learns from these ayahs, the people involved in these ayahs situation get hasanat, good deeds. So they still get, get good deeds until today. They had to be in those situations for us to learn, so they get very good. So we learn from the uh, experience and we implement the lesson in that it uh, amazing experience in a way, but it was painful for them. So even after they passed away, they still get the reward of learning so from us, learning from their experience. For every person among them is what punishment he has earned from the sin, and who uh, he who took upon himself the greater portion therefore, for him is a great punishment. Min if from this sin or evil. Many people get caught up in this evil. Even some great Sahaba, عنهم, like Hassan ibn Thab, the great Sahabi, uh, who was the prophet poet, he wrote poems. The poet of Rasulullah and people uh, listen to a poet so the evil spread. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends uh, by declaring a great punishment for the chief. Uh, uh, servant head of Munafiqeen, which is Abdullah ibn Ray al Salum, although he is not mentioned by name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about Abdullah ibn Ray al Salum without mentioning his name. Again, it was easy. The Prophet knows who spread that moment and he could go and you know kill that person or kill those people who spoke bad about his wife. Even it's clean now, after the revelation came down. He could go and do that. And no one would blame him for it. Right? Because it's his dignity, he's out. Alright? With that mentality back then. But, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet sallam, that this person will have his severe punishment in Akhra. He didn't need to do anything. And the Prophet sallam, uh, style, he never took revenge for himself. He is the Prophet of Allah. He never took revenge for himself. Always. Okay? So in Ayah number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, giving instruction to all the believers at that time, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالِ هَلَا إِذْكُمْ يَدِينَ When you all heard it, heard the rooms, you're all uh, in a second person. you all. ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ if you all, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking to about them in a second person, So, when you all heard, did not the, believe, the believing men and believing women think good of one another? This clause is that the third person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't say, why is that? Why is it that you did not think good of one another? That's why I was came in second person, not a third person. Allah did not say 
uh, why is that you didn't think good of one another? You people did not do, do it because your Iman wasn't strong enough. This kind of a thing only a mu'min or a mu'mina would do. You people disappointment. That's literally what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying today. So the only the mu'minin, okay? The mu'min, Allah described the mu'minin, those with the strong iman, because we know Islam and iman and iqsan. So the higher, the better our iman level is, and until we reach the level of iqsan. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described those who did not react to these rumors, that they did not engage in those rumors, and do not continue to spread it in the community, Allah described them as believers, mu'minun wal mu'mina, believing men and believing women. Okay? What they did? They had good assumptions of others. Banna had good assumptions of themselves and others. But they have good thoughts about Aisha about the names were mentioned. They didn't have any evil thoughts. Banna al mu'minuna wal mu'minatu bi anfusihim fayya wa qalu hadha ifkum muhim. They deny it and they say this is a great lie. This is an evil law. So they not just deny it, but they also declare it. And uh, stood against everyone in the community who said those evil things. And this is another example for us to be positive in the community. And not just uh, be quiet. Because sometimes being silenced is not helping. You need to stand up for the haq. You need to defend your brothers and sisters when, when you are in time. When you are in your situation. Okay? And you need to think positive about other people. This is our responsibility, the collective responsibility of the Muslim Ummah. To defend one another. The Prophet spoke about this Ummah. You know, the believers, and again, Allah, the Prophet used the, the term believers. Uh, towards each other is like a one whole body. If one part feels sick, the rest of the body feels the fever and sleepless night because of that part. We all as one unit. And another hadith of Prophet described the Ummah as like uh, the believer to another is like break to another, hold each other tight. So these uh, meanings that's explained through the Quran and the Sunnah, and in Surah Hajrat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the believers saying, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَا فَرَكُمْ Indeed, believers are our brothers or sisters sharing the same faith. And we spoke about you know, the, the relationship of the deen is stronger than the relationship of the blind. If I have a, 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 a brother who, who shares the same father and same mother with me, and he's not a Muslim, and I have another brother from different country, from different parents, but he's a Muslim, he's closer to me than my own brother. Because we share the bond of religion, the bond of Iman. Right? And we, th- we saw that clearly through the history of the the Bible from Rasulullah and the Sahaba. And how the Sahaba, some of them stood against their families because they were Muslim. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not happy with those who went with the flow, those who didn't stand their ground, those who thought bad about other people. And he described only those who in the community, those who stood against the rulers, those who uh, call those who call the rumors kazab or ifkum mubin are the believers, believing men and women. And this is the, the good example, like giving us the good example and how we should react in that time, in that time of rumors. Uh, because they have a strong iman. So why is that your iman wasn't challenged? Because con- controversially, aside, this is a matter of faith. This is when translated into our time be- becomes a matter of faith. For us, when someone talks about the dignity of the Muslim, we um, we have to categorically apply uh, if we see uh, any such things being said. We have to apply that we don't agree with this. We have to apply that we don't uh, spread the rules and say this is obvious falsehood. So what we say. We should say, هذا إفكم مبين, obvious falsehood. وقال, they, the mu'minun, said, would say, and not قلتم, you would say, the believers would say that, uh, how, how come you did not say this? Allah is asking some 
very strong question that Muslims find themselves very ashamed at. In ayah number 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْلَا جَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُهَدَاءِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنَّ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَابِلُونَ Why didn't they, uh, for those who slander, not to produce for it full witness? And when they do not produce the witness, then it's the Uday uh, in the Sahar of Allah who are the liar. And remember, we spoke about this previously that the punishment of the slander, if someone accused someone of something, they need to provide four witnesses. And the only case exempt, remember, what, what case was exempt from this? That the, only, the one person can accuse other. Correct. So it's, it's just between the husband and wife. This is the only case exam, and they have to fulfill uh, uh, a certain criteria to apply this. Okay? So why did they, or those who slander, have not produce for a full witness? And when they do not produce the witnesses, then it's uh, they in the sight of Allah who are the light. So if you don't produce the witness, that means you're definitely the light. So this might sound strange, considering that the ayah to present for witness just came, so the, the accusers could gain uh, clemency by saying this ayah just came down, and we did not, uh, we didn't, uh, we did not anything about, we did not, we didn't, we did not know anything about this condition before we said what we said. So remember, in the in the context of the surah, the ayah of Qad came before. The ayat uh, or the ayat of um, uh, slandering Aisha radiallahu anha. So they should know better. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say. Without knowing the jaw alayhi wa ba'at, Allah reminding them again. And in fact, those who commit unlawful uh, sexual intercourse of your women bring against them for witness from among you. And if they testify, confine the guilty women to houses until death takes them, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala them for them another way. These ayats were revealed in Surah An-Nisa. So these two uh, ayat, or this ayat, was revealed in Surah An-Nisa, uh, but they did not have the impact that was required. So now uh, the panel code had to be there. So some people would learn only by wit. This is where this is where we see Allah's hikmah and His progression in teaching us the way we. He subhanahu wa ta'ala did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows these people better than they know themselves. But he's still being kind enough to not reveal the law in its full extent altogether. This is out of the hikmah and out of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they do not produce the witness, then it is they in the sight of Allah who are the uh, After all of this, uh, if four witnesses are not produced, then no matter what what you or we think, in front of Allah, these are the lies, completely. So we don't know what happened, we don't know what they saw, but for us, and in the sight of Allah, they are the lies. No matter what their families or friends think, or they think they're honest people or truthful, but if they don't produce the full witness, they are this is what Allah says in the Quran. If, if they don't produce full witness, they are in the sight of Allah, are the light. In the Muslim. No matter what their families or friends think, does not matter what you are, uh, or you or I think. The only thing that matter is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala think. He is the only judge that. And with this, inshallah, we'll finish for tonight. And we'll continue from Ayah 14 next week, inshallah. Mm-hmm.